17 minutes to 7 as Jess and Jay May were just telling us in the news there are now 15.3 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, three times our total population. No community transmission here, of course, but roughly a million New Zealanders living outside the country. And if they're in the US or Brazil or India or the UK, they're living in epicentres. How do they get home if they want to or need to? And how do we manage their isolation alongside the isolation of non-New Zealanders whose presence in the country would drive income and jobs? The avatar exemption in short. If we can get this right we can do three remarkable things we can be a place of safety we can stay a place of safety and we can look for greater economic engagement with the world that would be a triumph but how do we do that safely the New Zealand initiative has come up with a report I have it here proposing some answers and joining us now is the author of that report the New Zealand initiative CEO Dr Eric Crampton Eric it's really nice to have you with us Good morning. Good morning. Boy, there's a lot in this, and I, I don't know which quote to start with. There's some, uh, there, there's some bangers, but let's start with one million New Zealanders living overseas. In fact, it may be slightly more than that, half of which yep. live in Australia, and to quote you, all of whom have the right to return, preventing their entry would be neither legal nor ethical. So first of all, how the hell do we get their return right? But we need to be able to scale up systems at the border. So, so far we've been managing it by queuing. The government books in a few facilities and then tries to slot returning Kiwis into those very small number of spaces that the government has managed to contract for. And it's a bit of a shambles. Like it's all been working now under military oversight that we've not been having breakouts. But it's a, in the back end is very difficult. You've got a lot of uncertainty about who's going to be coming in and when they're going to be arriving and whether it's all going to mash up with the number of spaces available. We're arguing for a flipping of the system requiring those who are coming back, whether returning citizens or others, to have a booking at one of the government's managed isolation facilities before they even show up at the gate abroad to board the plane. That would then help the government in ensuring that they have the right number of spaces, but it also give a lot of other opportunities opportunities. So where both the government and the opposition have been talking about user fees, and I don't know what the right level of those should be or who should be charged fees and who should be allowed free entry, what I do think we could do is instead of charging fees to those the government would want to charge, we could provide vouchers equivalent to the cost of a stay at a fairly basic facility to those the government would like to help that they could apply to the cost of their own stay. This would then help the whole system start scaling up. Right. Eric, I'm going to come in there because the vouchers, people are going to be thinking, how would that work? Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm losing my uh, earpiece. Did you, get, you got my question? How would yeah, the vouchers work? I did, I did work? get yep, your question. Yep. I apologize for that. Instead of charging a fee to those, those people that the government thinks should be charged, they could provide a voucher for the value of a stay at a basic facility to returning citizens and residents that the government thinks should be eligible for some support. And people differ on who precisely should be eligible. I think everybody basically agrees that... Kiwis who were stuck abroad through no fault of their own in March when everything turned to fire, they should get some assistance in coming back. They shouldn't be bearing those costs. And I think a lot of people agree that if I decided to go on an overseas holiday now, the taxpayer shouldn't be covering the cost of my return. In between those, there's some disagreement. We're not, we're not putting a position up about who should pay and who shouldn't, but rather that if the government wants to support the return of some folks, it should do that through vouchers and then let them choose their own bookings at the times and places that work. Okay. Uh, th th boy, there's a lot to discuss here. Uh, I, I, I cited in the intro the avatar exemption, which yep. is that people who can make a compelling case that their economic contributions to New Zealand would be so great that they're granted ministerial exemption as non-New Zealanders to come here. You talk in this report about uh, the humanitarian and economic case for getting the balancing act right between New Zealanders who want to return and people who will contribute a great deal to our economy, given the finite capacity for isolation and quarantine at the border. So how do we address that either or situation? Yep. We come up with a system that can scale better. So what I'm arguing for is the government charging fees to facilities for the services the government provides in military oversight, in police monitoring, and in health services. The facilities charging the fees that make sense for them. The government providing a voucher to, for returning Kiwis that they want to support. People making their own bookings. And then if we say, saw, for example, that things were looking a little bit tight you know, over the Christmas period, lots of people were wanting to come back and prices started going up in those facilities in the same way that we're already really used to as prices go up during school holidays and hotels or during the Christmas break. 
other facilities would see that and say, wow, I could make a buck by shifting into being a managed isolation facility. I could more than cover the cost of paying the government for right, the okay. services. Okay. And we'd get a lot more capacity. Ooh, okay. So, so, so what you're saying is we can scale up the number of isolation and quarantine facilities. Yep. We can provide vouchers to support New Zealanders who demonstrably have a compelling case to come back at the taxpayer's expense. And there are yep. a million of us li living abroad and many of those people will be in stressful circumstances now. But we can also provide a user pays arrangement for people who might choose now to go overseas on a holiday and then want to return. Bugger them, the taxpayer shouldn't foot that bill. And also a user pays arrangement for people who come here with a demonstrable economic case for their presence in the country. But we still need to be safe from the risk of COVID-19. We sure do. Yeah, and also in, in the case that we're making, it would no longer be up to the minister to decide whose case is most important. Like those, put, that puts the minister in, into an impossible position. You've got special pleading from all kinds of people who have really heart-rending cases and others where the cases seem really economically important. How does the minister even decide across those? If instead the minister were providing vouchers to help support the return of those citizens that the government wants to help, but letting anyone book into the managed isolation facilities, and then you start letting the system just work, right? More facilities could come on stream, prices would go up, that would start rationing demand and let people choose the times of their arrivals. Okay, Eric, final question, because I've had the rap and it was quite a definitive rap and it was, it was seldom that I really take notice of the rap call, but I am now, kind of. You're not saying we should soften our rigorous approach to safety at the border. And, and boy, not. that's a big shake of the head. OK, so that's really important. Gosh, there's a lot in here, Eric. And on the face of it, 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 it seems worth considering. So how do people read this? Because it's a big report and we haven't uh, managed to pricey all of it. It's 21 pages. How do people read it? It's on our website. It's free to download. And we've written in a fairly accessible language. It's not, it's not no, a daunting no. econ speak thing. No. It's just like out the case of how this would work, what the traveler's experience would look like under this kind of a system, and all, some of the opportunities that start opening up. When half of America is working remotely currently, some of them might want to join us here and take bringing their jobs with them. They w there's no talk then about uh, stealing Kiwis jobs. They'd be bringing their jobs with them here, continue to be paid from abroad, spend in our local communities, and take the place of some of the tourists who would never show up on a two-week isolation period. People who'd be willing to come in for a year or more, two weeks is a bit of a dawdle. Dr. Eric Crampton from the New Zealand Initiative. The Safe Arrivals Research Note is on their website. We really appreciate you joining us this morning. Thanks, Eric. Lots to talk about there.